you. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is, uh, is talk about rigorous impact evaluation and specifically the why and the when. Uh, why do it and under what circumstances to do it. Uh, trying to make the, the point very concretely by looking at one very specific high profile development project, the Millennium Village project. Here's a, a quick outline of where we're going. I want to talk about past experiences with development projects in the genre of this project. Uh, a little more detail about the Millennium Village project. Uh, initial uh, preliminary impact estimates that have been released by the project. Uh, then I'm going to pass it over to Gabriel to talk about uh, 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 some uh, alternative ways to interpret the, the impact of the project. Um, and then finally I'll come back to close it talking about one proposal of a way that, uh, that an impact evaluation could be done in this setting. So um, that's where we're going. And I want to step way back and talk about what we're doing. What, what are we doing when we're doing uh, rigorous impact evaluation? To, to, to me personally, what it's about is, is uh, going beyond ourselves when we are doing development work. That is, uh, the point of a rigorous impact evaluation is to, to change other people's minds about what is possible. That's why to do this. And there are two steps to changing people's minds. You have to take into account their prior beliefs, what they think right now, and you have to give them a reason to change it. If you want to move a pig, you have to go where the pig is, and you have to give it a reason to move. And uh, that's why the two things that I'll talk about are some reasonable prior beliefs about a project of this kind, and uh, uh, what it would take to get convincing evidence to change those priors. Um, this is where my priors come from. It's a, a village called Santa Cecilia, Colombia, in the western part of Isaralda department, where I lived for a short time working with a village level package intervention uh, as a young guy. Um, this intervention was agricultural extension work coupled with education, health, and infrastructure <coughs> investments. Uh, the headquarters of a, a preceding project called Plosan are there. Most of that building was abandoned when I arrived because the project had concluded, and everybody in the village told me that the thing had no lasting impact on them. They were very down on Plosan. And as a young idealistic guy, it was, it was, it was shocking to show up in a place and, and, and realize that uh, lots of people had come from Mededa to help, and nobody thought that they had. Uh, I got really interested in that subject. Later, I was to discover that, that, that the kind of work they were doing was, uh, was part of a genre of, of work that the, the bank has been heavily involved in over decades. Um, uh, much of it went under the, the term integrated rural development, village level, local, regional package interventions, multi-sectoral interventions in rural villages uh, over a few years' time. And uh, Gabriel and I found it interesting to look in some of the bank documents about past experiences of, of that kind. So uh, here is uh, one project. Uh, the second phase of the Kenya Integrated Agricultural Development Project. Um, going to the staff appraisal report in 1979, um, it uh, takes the whole farm approach. Installation and maintenance of roads, water supplies, other rural infrastructure, provision of research extension and stuff in farmer training, input and output marketing, credit, price controls, regulation of land title. You can see the, the model here, and it's quite a plausible model, uh, and that there are several bank documents about it from the mid-70s is that uh, you can get synergies from solving several problems simultaneously. That you wouldn't get it if you just went in with credit, for example. Um, so it, it, it's fascinating to go a decade later to the project completion report and see that the project had no sustained impact on farmers. The experience of such projects has not been good, and bank operations have since veered away from this concept. Um, the, uh, the total expenditure on this project in 2010 dollars was 50 million dollars. 50 million dollars. So that's a disappointing sentence. This project had no sustained impact on farming. Um, it's uh, it's interesting to go on to some others. I, I should mention that uh, that uh, the some of the 40,000 households that were targeted by the Kenya project are uh, not so far from where the Millennium Village project is doing some of its work right now in the Anza province of uh, of Kenya. So, uh, another project, the Gaon Ashanti Region Cocoa Project from the 1980s. Um, 
I, I, I compared the maps, and uh, one of the intervention sites of this project is just 10 miles from Botsaso, Ghana, where uh, uh, the Millennium Village Project is also working in, uh, in Ashanti region. Staff appraisal report 1975. Uh, it's part of an overall development plan, rational informed uh, pricing policy, farm input distribution system, uh, creating in kind for farm inputs, planning and feeder roads, training of farmers. They had an independent evaluation done through an excellent think tank, ISR, which is still around. Um, and uh, fast forward a decade, the principal lessons that emerge from the experience of this project are that small geographically combined projects are usually ineffective vehicles for addressing and resolving <coughs> sector issues. Uh, what these, uh, what the people who wrote this report, I didn't look up who they were. One of them might be in the room. I'm sure a few of them are around the building still. Uh, what they're saying, and this is really remarkable, and a, 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 a senior former World Bank official pointed this out to me, is that very rarely in the history of the bank has it given up entirely on an entire genre of lending. And this is one of those cases. The bank stopped doing these. The bank veered away from this concept because of several failures in this area. Um, I, I should point out uh, that the total expenditure on, on Ghana Ashanti Region corporate project was $125 million in 2010. $125 million. Let's go to another one. Cameroon Western Province Rural Development Project. Um, uh, there's a, 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 a 12 point uh, multi sectoral plan for this one. Fertilizers and pesticides, <coughs> soil conservation and reforestation, village level water points, feeder roads, again, monitoring and evaluation plan. Um, 10 years and $65 million later, $65 million again in 2010 dollars. Production fell rather than increased. Typically for such integrated rural development approaches, the government is unable to finance operations without further assistance. The government and the bank have discarded the regional approach. Full stop. Um, these are very disappointing. Now, none of what I've been saying constitutes a rigorous evaluation at all. We're cherry picking a few projects. Um, these are some bad experiences. It is notable that the bank collectively decided that this entire approach was not worthwhile, so that's informative. But uh, none of these, I, I, at least to my knowledge, were rigorously evaluated in, in the sense that we would use that term now. Uh, one such project that the, the bank has been deeply involved in has been rigorously evaluated. And that's uh, the, the Southwest Poverty Reduction Project, um, about which uh, uh, Shahua Chen, Ren Mu, and Ron Revalian just wrote a fantastic uh, paper. So this was a uh, huge multi-sectoral village level package development intervention in Southwest China, uh, executed in the late 1990s. Uh, $250,000 per village, 1,800 villages, total expenditure in 2010 dollars, $580 million, half a billion dollars on this budget. Um, here is uh, a screenshot from the project completion report. Many problems, many solutions. Uh, health problems, nutrition problems, the schools are terrible, uh, access to land is very bad, and there are no markets for agricultural products, and we're going to solve all of these things. Um, they did that, again, $580 million over five years. These were five-year uh, uh, village-level package interventions after which the project ended. And uh, here's the project completion report. Highly satisfactory. Why highly satisfactory? Because the project had a major impact on, on policy. That's how they're measuring the impact here. That it changed policy by demonstrating the effectiveness of a, a multi-sectoral poverty reduction model. Um, so, uh, what is effectiveness? Well, what uh, Chen Mu and Revalium document is one way you could measure effectiveness is did incomes go up? In a poverty reduction project, uh, you would think that that's a necessary condition for the thing to work. And here are uh, dips and dips where the a uh, yellow line here measures um, a random sample of households in the 1800 treatment villages, and the green line measures uh, on the vertical axis uh, household income in uh, constant yuan. The green axis measures uh, a random sample of households in the treated provinces that were not treated. And the project began uh, around 1995, ended in 2000. During the project, it's very clear that incomes are going up much faster in the treatment building, in the treatment households than, uh, than in the untreated households. Here's what happened five years after the project ended. Nothing. That is, the, the, the in incomes in the treated households increased as much as a totally untreated household. 
and, and that's uh, that, that that's one of many reasons to, to read that that uh, the very interesting paper. It suggests that the results at different points in time can be completely different. And uh, note also that even if we were just looking at the 1995-2000 period, incomes are going up in the control villages. Looking over this entire period collectively, 1995 to 2005, uh, incomes are going up in China because China is undergoing an economic revolution at this point. And the contribution of the Southwest Village Project to even the medium-term trends in those variables in this setting is not $580 million spent. So uh, that's where the pig is, in, in my mind. Uh, there, are, there are good reasons to have priors that, uh, you, even in the short term, and at least in the medium term, there are big problems with this approach. And that the bank as an institution, I, I, I think, uh, has, has certainly concluded that. Um, now, uh, I, I want to talk about the, the, the Millennium Village project. So, this is a, uh, a village so, level. Can I ask a question? Can you clarify a question? Yes, when you say that there are problems with this approach, what is this approach? So, a uh, um, uh, uh, multi sectoral uh, 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 village level uh, or small region level uh, package intervention where uh, uh, complementary interventions are, are coupled with an agricultural extension project. It's not a concise definition, but, but I, I, maybe somebody has a better definition of integrated rural development, but to me that would be the, the, the definition. Um, the Millennium Village project is uh, not identical to those projects, but it shares a lot of the same characteristics. It, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, a, a lot of money, uh, one and a half million dollars per village cluster, average population 5,000, um, over five years, short period, in five areas uh, that uh, the, the writings of Jeff Sachs call uh, the big five interventions of uh, uh, health, education, water and sanitation, uh, agriculture and infrastructure. And uh, we'll, we'll look at, uh, at some of the interventions in a minute. Here are 12, the, the first 12 of the villages where the, of the village clusters, I should say, where the, where the project is active, 10 countries across Africa, uh, beginning in, in uh, 2004. Um, here are some elements of the package. Uh, fertilizer, bed nets, school lunches, safe water points, um, uh, uh, different interventions to empower women, uh, antiretrovirals in some cases, internet connections in some cases, local clinics, and uh, uh, environmental sustainability, including uh, uh, soil conservation measures. So, um, how would we go about evaluating the impact of this uh, project? Yet getting now to, to starting from, from priors, which I've spent a lot of time talking about, how would we, how would we get convincing evidence to move those priors, you can see where mine are, about uh, about interventions of this type. Well, to, to, to start, we would need to say, okay, what's the goal? We, we need a, a metric to evaluate uh, how far we're moving the pig. And um, that, that's not easy in the case of the Millennium Village Project because there have been several stated goals coming out of the project. Um, I'll, I'll show you a bunch of clippings from, from publications of the project. Uh, it, it, it says it will solve extreme poverty. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, it, it's difficult to define that, of course. Solution, to me, conveys a sense of permanence, to be sure. So we're, we're talking about a, a something which doesn't just happen one day and it's over the next. That's not a solution. Um, uh, it has said that it, it can meet the Millennium Development Goals. That the first Millennium Development Goal is a halving of poverty, not an elimination of poverty. And it's at a global level, not a village level. So I'm not sure exactly what that means. But this is an assertion of the project as well. Um, that it can achieve self-sustaining economic growth in the villages, which is different from the first two goals. Um, that they can lift themselves out of extreme poverty in five years' time, which is a qualification of the earlier goals. It can happen in five years. Um, that a uh, one-step targeted infusion of foreign assistance uh, can be an exit strategy from the poverty trap. Uh, springing them out of, of poverty traps, and again, that conveys to me a, a sense of lastingness. Leaving a poverty trap, uh, uh, the definition means you don't go back into it later. Um, the, the, uh, the evaluation protocol of the Millennium Village Project focuses uh, mainly on child mortality, which is separate from everything we've looked at so far. 
and uh, in in their response to our paper, the, the the leaders of the project say, no, 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 you don't understand. It's, it's about designing and documenting effective delivery systems for interventions that are already proven. So if, if, if you take this statement for at face value, the, the outcome of the project, the impact of the project, is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, the design and documentation of effective and, and uh, affordable delivery systems. You, you can imagine evaluations that compare performance of the project against all of these. Um, so it's, it would be hard to choose one. But we can start with one report of the, of the project where it asserts impacts in certain areas. So in, uh, in June of this year, the, the project uh, uh, released a report called Harvest of Development, where it says very clearly, the impacts of our project are, and then it lists some changes in the in some of the uh, Millennium Village sites. It doesn't contain information on all the sites, I believe it's six of them. Is that right, Gabriel? Five or six? I think it's six. six. Um, for example, Saudi Kenya, but not there to Kenya. Um, and uh, it says, look, uh, uh, levels, of measles effects, me levels of measles immunization have increased. And this is listed under project impacts. Um, here is an effect or impact. 30% uh, increase in women giving birth in the presence of a skilled birth attendant. Um, later in the report, here is uh, in the section on Bonsaso, Ghana, the biggest impacts of the project include ownership of mobile phones has increased 4% to 30%. Now, uh, there's something fundamentally unsatisfying about statements like this, and uh, to explain why, I want to pass to, to Gabriel right now. Thanks, Michael. I'm still wondering who's the pig in your analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, my beliefs. My right. beliefs, beliefs. Okay, okay. Just as long as it's not me. No. <laughs> okay, so um, that was a very good uh, you know, introduction. So now I have to get a little more to the heart of the paper. Uh, but even before I do that, I'm going to talk about a field trip I took to the first money village, uh, which is Saori, Bar Saori, Kenya. Uh, so that's, so this is the map of Kenya here, you can see, so here's Nairobi, and so the Barcelona is here at the western edge of Kenya, uh, right here. So in this visit in September, I went to both Barcelona and another village, which is about 50 kilometers to the west, uh, which is not the Millennium Village uh, site, uh, which is Oranka. And so I should emphasize that we wrote uh, the entire paper, did everything but the final finishing touches before the visit. So really nothing I'm going to describe from the visit in form what's directly paper. Uh, nonetheless, I think it gives you some sense of the important issues that we're trying to address with the paper. Okay, so these are a few photos from our visits. Uh, the one that we're left is my group visiting a uh, fish farm. And so I went with a whole bunch of people from the bank office in Nairobi, including two uh, who have family in the area and who were very familiar with rural Nyanza. So here I am uh, plush, pressing the flesh with some kids at a primary school. And this is a street scene uh, in Barcelona. And this is some random guy uh, talking on the mobile phone, <laughs> which is a very common sight everywhere in Kenya. Uh, so, in general, I would say, uh, so I would say in Barcelona, we visited a health clinic, or we visited a school, uh, we talked to various people who were involved in uh, various income generating projects, which are part of the Money Village project. I want to focus a bit on the health clinic visit because uh, that's really in most clearly to what we do in the paper. So this is the Gongo Health Center, and so this is me uh, arriving with uh, my colleague Fred Owegi at the health center. The health center was built entirely with funds from the Money Villages Project, and it has uh, 12 stock with drugs, as you can see in the picture here, uh, and generally has pretty nice uh, facilities. Uh, and there's, there's a medical officer, uh, three nurses, and a medical technician who are all paid directly by the Money Villages Project. So overall, this looks like a success story for the project. And, According to the project coordinator, there have been improvements in health outcomes as a consequence of, of this clinic and other uh, health centers developed by the project. So the next day, we went to uh, Uranga, which uh, superficially looks extremely similar to Barsaori. I think uh, if someone walked into Barsaori and somebody walked into Uranga, they, and someone said one of these places has had massive interventions, you wouldn't be able to say based on a superficial, uh, superficial analysis which was the Millennium Village site. Uh, 
Uh, so the upper left picture here, this is uh, so a mobile phone charging station at a market that we visited. Uh, we, we visited a couple schools, uh, which generally looked quite good, uh, exceeded my expectations in terms of general quality of the facilities. And the rest of the pictures here are from a health clinic we visited in Aranda. Uh, and this health clinic is, so I should say it's not, not a government health clinic, uh, it's funded by a mix of income uh, sources. It receives some money from the government, uh, it's also funded in part by the Catholic Church, and it receives a bulk of its income from uh, fees that it charges to, to users. So this here, uh, this is the it's sort of a complex water uh, delivery facility at the back. Uh, this is my colleague, Ian Katimba, sitting at the entrance. Uh, this is uh, this is a room and a couple beds in the clinic. Uh, this is, uh, these are some of my colleagues, and this is sister, Anita Odera, who, uh, who runs the clinic. Uh, and notable here is the fact that uh, she has Barack Obama's Here's my father, <laughs> prominently displayed on her desk. Um, so this is, this actually is Obama's uh, ancestral homeland. His, his grandmother lives pretty much right in between Aranda and Barcelona. And we, we actually did stop by to visit her grandmother, his grandmother's house, but we didn't knock on her door because I, I felt like uh, I was too embarrassed to actually go <laughs> right in a picture of Obama's grandmother. Although my mother would have been very impressed if I had a picture. Okay, so. Um, when we talked to uh, Sister Rita Odera, she is clearly extremely devoted, very warm-hearted warm uh, woman, and she described there have been lots of improvements in the quality of health outcomes in the immediate area around Iran. As she said, uh, in her experience since 2006, there have been a big increase in measles immunization rates, uh, in HIV testing rates, and in the fraction of women uh, who had their births at the clinic rather than at home, which is a quite an important uh, in Kenya. So the fact that you can see in this site, which is not a Millennium Village, there have been, at least anecdotally, big improvements, that suggests that in, in trying to evaluate the effects of the Millennium Villages project, we need to think very carefully about what's going on in area, uh, areas uh, around the Millennium Village. So that ultimately the question is, what would have happened in, at the Millennium Village site if there hadn't been those interventions? So what we do uh, is we take a look at, at uh, what happened at the Millennium Villages sites compared to what happened in the country as a whole, uh, in rural areas of the country, and in rural areas of the region where the Millennium Village is located. And so we do this for the three uh, Millennium Village sites where we have all the needed information. So this, these are uh, for, uh, the site in Kenya, a site in Ghana, and a site in Nigeria. Uh, so these are uh, sites that, where there's information from the Harvest Development Report that Michael will mention. We also have DHS data from before the intervention and <coughs> recently, so we can look at, at the overall trends. So this is for the case of Kenya, uh, measles vaccinations. So the white line here shows the increase in measles vaccination that the Millennium Villages reported uh, at, uh, at the Sowardy site. Okay. Then the red line here shows, based on DHS data, the measles vaccination rate changes uh, for the country as a whole. The green line shows the trend for rural Kenya, and then the blue line shows the trend for rural areas of Nyanza, which is the, the region uh, uh, where parts of is located. So you can see there's been, uh, in Kenya as a whole, and especially in rural Nyanza, there have been increases in the, the measles vaccination rate, which is exactly what uh, Sister Rodera told us uh, at, our, at our clinic. But there's been a, a larger increase uh, in the Sowardy site. So our, a big chunk of our paper is a whole series of graphs like this with varying various indicators. And the overall story is, is very mixed. So this is, this is one case. Here is the same kind of graph for Ghana. So you can see in Ghana, there were actually much faster increases in the rates of vaccination rates uh, in all the area, all the comparison areas than there were in uh, the Millennium site. And then for Nigeria, you see a fairly similar picture to what you see in Kenya. So there's a faster increase at the Millennium Village site, but there are also increases in all comparison areas. So I'll go through a few more of these. This is uh, so it's a skill tendency at birth. This was another uh, issue that was mentioned by Sister Odera at the, at the Clinic of Ranga. So you can see uh, the, the phenomenon she mentioned of an increase in skill attendance in the area around her clinic. You see that in, in rural Nyanza as a whole. That's, that's the blue line. And surprisingly, there was actually a decline in the rate of school attendance at the Millennium Village site. Okay, 
So in Ghana, you see an increase, uh, increases both in the comparison areas and the million village site. And, and in Nigeria, it's pretty much flat, both at the site and the comparison areas. Okay, so here's a different indicator. This is stunt, the rate of stunting, which is a uh, measure of, of child malnutrition. So you see, for ba basically for Kenya and rural Nyanza and rural Kenya, the rate of stunting has been flat compared to what's happened with DHS data. With Wild and Millennium Village, there's been a substantial decline in the rate of stunting. But then in Ghana, there's been a decline at the Millennium Village site, which exactly matches the overall decline in rural areas of the region where the site it is located. Okay, and then in Nigeria, you see a much bigger decline uh, in the Nigeria site than in the surrounding areas. Okay, so let me go through, I think, just, I think this is the last indicator I'll look at. So they also um, highlight mobile phone ownership in the Harvest Development Report, and the increase in mobile phone ownership is a big success of the project. But then we see, looking at what's happened uh, in Kenya as a whole, and really in all three of these countries, there have been increases in the rate of mobile phone ownership, which pretty much exactly track what's happened at the Millennium Village sites. So and for anybody who's spent time in Africa the last few years, it's not surprising because there's been you know, everywhere an explosion in mobile phone ownership. In fact, we just did a, a separate paper looking at mobile money in Kenya, and so for that I looked very carefully at the estimates of mobile phone ownership. So here, for 2008, it shows, what does it show? Uh, it shows about 50%. We, we estimate now it's about 75% of households in Kenya as a whole that <coughs> mobile phones. So this, in other words, this line is kept going up uh, over time. Okay, so here you see the same thing for Ghana, for mobile phone ownership, and pretty much the same story uh, in Nigeria. I'll skip over these. All right, so taking these, uh, taking all the information that I showed in those graphs, uh, you can think about two different types of impact estimates. So the first is what was done in the Harvest Development Report, or what is implicit in the Harvest of Development Report, which is just to do this before versus after, simple differences comparison. Uh, so in the report, they say uh, the biggest impacts, one of the biggest impacts of the project was ownership of mobile phones has increased from 4% to 30%. So this is in, in Barcelona. So they I don't, I don't think they actually do this calculation, but you know, implicitly they're saying there was 26% 26 increase, and that's attributable to the project. Okay, so uh, a different type of impact estimate is to do this differences and differences approach, which is basically to take this 26% and then subtract off the change in the relevant comparison area. So we do this in the paper, taking the relevant comparison area as rural areas of the region around the Millennium Village's site. So for the, ca the case of mobile phone ownership, the increase happens to be exactly the same as what you see in the Millennium Village site, so 26% increase. Uh, and so you actually get an estimate of zero for this particular case. As you saw, you get uh, the, the the comparison of the trends in the million village sites to the areas, the surrounding areas, varies a lot depending on the indicator in the country. So this is sort of the worst case for the million villages project. But for other indicators, uh, you do get you know, varying uh, impact estimates. So we, I know you can't read the details in this, but we summarize all of that in the paper with this graph, which shows the blue bar is the simple differences estimate. This is what's implicit out of the harvest, harvest development report. And then the red bar is the differences and differences estimate uh, that I just described. So again, there's lots of variation. Uh, sort of waving my hands across all of the estimates, I could say on average, very, very roughly across all the estimates, uh, the differences and differences estimates are about half of the simple differences. Again, with lots and lots of variation across indicators. Okay, so uh, I want to emphasize that the I think neither of these estimates are rigorous estimates of the impact of the project. Uh, so clearly, the differences differences estimates are a bit better than, than the naive simple differences estimates. But even the differences differences estimates, they don't take into account, uh, in particular, selection bias, uh, which may may be associated with the selection of initial sites. Uh, so I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, the additional plans for evaluation that the Millennium Villages Project has. So what we've, what we've first discussed is what they've already done, and we've given our sort of critical take on the Harvest Development Report. But 
they have additional plans for impact evaluation. So I'm going to describe those plans and why we think those are all, also inadequate to have substantial weaknesses. But then we're going to have a positive story, and I'll go back to Michael, and he'll talk about what they can do going forward. Okay, so they have this very detailed evaluation protocol, and I was uh, saying just before the talk that I think uh, Michael and I are probably the only people who've actually read the evaluation protocol, other than the <laughs> authors. It's quite, it's a little bit hard to find on the web, and it's, it's quite lengthy and detailed. So the protocol lays out, so it, it, has a, it actually has a three-part evaluation. And the evaluation includes uh, both an impact evaluation, so this is from the introduction to the, the protocol, the first part is examining impact on child survival and related outcomes. But then it also specifies a uh, process evaluation, which is the second part of the phrase here, and then an evaluation of costs. Uh, and so it goes into all three. We only look at the impact evaluation. So I, I want to stress that we're not talking about the process evaluation, cost evaluation, even though those are clearly uh, important. Okay, so this is the, I think they list this as the hypothesis for the impact evaluation which is that uh, after five years of operation, the project will uh, lower child mortality by 50% and have parallel gains in other secondary outcomes. So the essential features of this planned evaluation protocol are that they have a set of comparison villages, which they picked after the Millennium Village project was initiated at the Millennium Village sites. Uh, and they have surveys, uh, household surveys from the Millennium Village sites at, the, at baseline, uh, at year three and at year five. And then they, then they have surveys from the comparison villages uh, at years three and five only. So they, so they don't have baseline information uh, for the comparison sites. So in the paper, we go through uh, quite detailed discussion of what we see as the five weaknesses of the protocol. I'm just going to emphasize now the two most important weaknesses. Maybe uh, Michael want to come back and discuss a little bit of the three that I uh, leave out. So the first weakness is that the Millennium Village sites themselves may not be typical cases. And this, the second is that the comparison villages uh, may differ in important ways from the Millennium Village sites. Let me just look my notes to make sure I'm not skipping anything. I'll talk about both of these, uh, both of these weaknesses. Okay, so the first one is that the Millennium Village sites themselves may not be typical cases. And so I should emphasize that uh, pretty much everything we point out as weakness is also discussed in the protocol. So in some sense, this is not news to the Millennium Villages project. Uh, we just think that the importance of these weaknesses is understated and has been underrepresented by the Millennium Villages. So the first part is that there may be bias in the selection of the money build sites. And they say this in the protocol, they say there may be non-random selection which can introduce uh, program placement uh, bias. And so this could take a few different forms. So they say, so on the one hand, the money build sites could be the worst cases. They could be the places where you would least expect the, the project to work. And they say communities were often among the most disadvantaged with high levels of baseline mortality, nutrition deficiencies helped to be desirable characteristics in the initial site selection. So this would suggest that maybe, in fact, the effects of the project uh, could be, in, in other potential villages, could be greater than what you see at the Millennium Village sites. So maybe these were just the very, very worst, uh, the worst cases. But on the other hand, they also say that the sites that were selected were selected uh, in part because of issues of feasibility, political buy-in, community ownership, and ethics. And so all of these points, I mean, I think anybody who's worked on any development project anywhere would recognize that these could be crucial in the success of a, of a project. So if, uh, if the Millennium Village sites met this criteria, then the effects we see at the Millennium Village sites might be much more than you would see sort of typical average uh, the village in the country. So why does this matter? Well, first, um, it might be, so why does it matter if the Millennium Village sites are not typical cases? Well, first, there's this internal validity question that if they're very if they're ex extraordinarily good or extraordinarily bad places, it might be hard to find the right set of control villages, the right comparison site. Uh, but then, what I've already mentioned a bit is that uh, the external validity question is, is actually crucial 
because the whole idea with the Millennium Builders Project, maybe I shouldn't say the whole idea, because there's many ideas, as Michael mentioned, but the general push has been to see the Millennium Builders Project as a model to be replicated across Africa. So that, so for that uh, understanding, external validity is really crucial. And if the Millennium Village sites, or the impacts we see in Millennium Village sites are very are atypical, they may not tell us what would happen if the project was scaled up to uh, other places. So just for the case, uh, so as I mentioned, the bias could go both directions. And my, my suspicion is it goes in one direction for some sites, and other, the other direction for other sites. So in particular, there are a couple places. There's a site in Ethiopia, and there's the Dare 2 site uh, in eastern Kenya, which according to various anecdotal reports, uh, according to the take I've seen from Jeff Sachs in uh, various interviews, they're really, really tough places. And they're places where you at least imagine a development project uh, taking hold. Uh, on the other hand, Barcelona we visited seems to be generally uh, a better case. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, two of my colleagues are, are from the area, and they both saw, the, so it's the game areas that are right around, and including Barsoori, and they both saw Barsoori as sort of the best place in rural Nyanza. And so I actually asked one of them to write up his thoughts on the area afterwards so that I could, I could give that to you. Um, so they said, um, so, he, so he wrote, so I should say that it's, 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 it's Luo is the dominant ethnic group around of our sorority. And so my colleague Fred is, is in Lua and has family in the area. And so he wrote, uh, Dear Gabriel, blow, uh, blow, please see my Luo man's snapshot assessment of game, which is the area around, including uh, our sorority. The, my assessment of game vis a vis the wider Nyanza province, an assessment I have held and carried long before the recent visit to our sorority. Considered against other regions in Nyanza, uh, game has been and remains amongst the best the best agricultural land out in the area. Uh, it has higher rainfall and better soils. Um, let's see. The game reason was it remains home to some of Nyanza's oldest and best performing schools, uh, which have, over the years, have produced many of the country's leading scholars, professionals, and politicians. And it gave me a long list of all the famous people who are from the area. And we also know uh, that there have been lots of interventions previous to the Money Village project. Uh, in the area. So I don't know exactly how, how Barcelona was, was selected, but there are a few reasons to think if you're looking for a place to, to launch some rural development project, Barcelona is probably uh, fertile ground for, for such a project. So okay, we're up the most, almost there. Um, uh, so I think I basically made this point that there, there may be differences between the comparison village sites uh, and the Millennium Village sites, and that's crucial for the evaluation. And they, in the end, they acknowledge this, acknowledge this in the... Uh, okay, so uh, we, I'm going to say, just go through quite quickly and say, we see uh, the progressive program as a model for how these kind of evaluations can be done in complex uh, village level interventions, which is what the progressive program is, clearly very different than the Millennium Villages project, uh, but we see this as a case where the, the Progresa evaluation uh, helped influence Im imitators. It uh, helped defend the, pro the project from political change. Uh, after the Fox re regime came in after Cedillo, the project was able to be continued basically in its original form because there was strong evidence that it worked. Uh, if the intervention, the evaluation informed the modification of the project as, as was expanded to urban areas, and it provided the basis for uh, more sustainable funding. And in general, it contributed to public knowledge, and there's a replication uh, of the progressive uh, of conditional cash transfers like the project and, and the evaluation. So this is all to say, I mean, part of the response we got from the Millennium Villages people was, oh, it would just be impossible to do uh, a good, a rigorous impact evaluation of the project, and also it's not really needed. And so we see the progressive uh, program as sort of a counter example of the case where uh, it, it was worthwhile and was very valuable for the Project. I think is that I think I'm stopping there, right? Okay, so I'll hand it over to the five. Okay, back to the pig for just a couple more minutes. Uh, so we something we do in the paper uh, incompletely, we just sketch uh, how uh, how we uh, would design a, a an evaluation, an impact evaluation for the Millennium Village project that would be convincing to us. 
and it's related to some designs that uh, some of my colleagues have proposed over the years to the Millennium Village uh, project. Um, this is not the only way to do it, but we propose a, a randomized design. So, um, um, the, as, as Gabriel mentioned, the, the explicit goal of the project is to massively scale up this intervention. Uh, in, in Jeff Sachs' first book, uh, he calls for a 15-fold increase in aid to Kenya, uh, $1.5 billion per year to fund uh, exactly these kind of interventions. So we're talking about a massive scale up, thousands of villages across the continent, and what will be proposed is just the next 20 of those be evaluated in a particular way. So this is really a drop in the bucket. Uh, during the pilot phase of, of what is envisioned to be a massive intervention continent-wide. Uh, one way to do it would be to take the next 20, um, find a nearby and similar village cluster for each of those 20, uh, matched on certain observable characteristics according to well-known protocols. Um, one uh, uh, convenient and great one is uh, uh, one that uh, David McKenzie here of the bank recently published in the AEJ Applied. Uh, that uh, uh, has a, a great data program along with it. It's very easy to implement. And uh, it, among, it, within each of these 20 matched pairs, randomized treatment. Uh, and follow these for 15 years. Four surveys, one at baseline, and three follow-up surveys. And I, I, I think the importance of the follow-up surveys is self-evident from some of the, the examples that we looked at before. Um, this design is not the only way to do it, but in our minds it would, it would solve all of the problems that Gabriel talked about. Um, uh, Non-random selection of treatment, non-random selection of comparison, uh, uh, lack of baseline data on the comparison villages, um, the uh, uh, sample size problems that we discussed in the paper, their evaluation has uh, 10 villages uh, matched with uh, X post chosen uh, uh, comparison sites. This we believe would give more statistical power to detect uh, differences and the uh, short-term nature of the evaluation, which, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I find very problematic. Um, we've done some uh, back-of-the-envelope power calculations uh, mm -hmm. with uh, an easily available uh, panel study um, started uh, here at the bank by Mead Over, who's now one of my colleagues at the CGD, the, the Kagera Health and Development Study, a very long-term panel study of uh, households in Kagera, Tanzania just to see in that data set, and obviously this has very tenuous external validity, um, but in that data set, what would it take to uh, detect treatment effects on different outcomes in a setting of this kind? A setting where you have uh, 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 initial matching of village clusters, and we used McKenzie's procedure in these data to match them on uh, size of the cluster, economic, major economic activity, religion and ethnicity, distance to nearest paved road, and electrification. So these are basically similar village pairs, and we have baseline data. So we're measuring, these are power calculations for changes, not levels. Um, for uh, primary school completion at the household level, uh, uh, the, the intra and inter-cluster variances in the KHDS data uh, for that particular outcome are such that uh, getting over about 10 matched pairs, you could start to uh, be 90% confident in being able to detect a 10% point uh, treatment effect with baseline data, 10 percent, percent point difference in changes. Um, uh, another outcome depends heavily on the outcome. Another outcome, uh, household level fraction of access to improved water sources. Uh, even going over 30 clusters, you couldn't be 90 percent confident of being able to detect a 10 percent point uh, treatment effect. Here, you'd want to get more towards uh, towards 20 in order to be able to get towards 10. And I think all of these are conservative because when we're talking about going 10 or 15 years out, uh, uh, it's reasonable to expect some attenuation of the treatment effects as Martin Rebellion saw in the Southwest project. And you'd want to be, be confident of being able to get somewhat smaller effects than we got right up front. Um, this is why in the paper we say, look, how about 20? And uh, uh, I, I've talked to some of the world's leading evaluation experts on this who have done many, many uh, randomized trials of this kind in Africa and asked them just point blank, how many village clusters would you need? And uh, one of the best in the world has told me 20. Uh, he had done the regression in his head, I guess. Um, but the, 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 we, we haven't done this very carefully, but I think there are good reasons to think that you need about 20. And 20 is really extremely few, few when you're thinking about a continent-wide intervention of thousands of, of, uh, of treatment sites, and it's cheap. So we, we worked with some experts here at the bank who have done a lot of work in this area, particularly in Africa, who helped us estimate that it would be less than 16% of, uh, of the treatment cost of those uh, 
uh, 20 villages to conduct an evaluation of this kind. 16% is uh, extremely little, uh, in my opinion, for a pilot phase of a massive company-wide uh, intervention. Um, so uh, we've talked mostly about uh, the, the why that I, I, I started this talk with. Um, that the, the same evidence, I think, suggests a win. To, to, to win, should we be doing this? But there's a lot of uh, a lot of heated debate. Uh, uh, sometimes there were some there were some there were some people hot under the collar in the recent Brookings conference on this. There are some strong statements in a, in the Journal of Economic Literature about this subject. Uh, some of the, the the best minds in the world, to say nothing of the best minds in this field, debating back and forth. Uh, uh, in what circumstances should rigorous evaluation of this kind be done? Uh, Esther Duflo, Michael Kramer, Abhijit uh, Banerjee, uh, Amos Deaton, uh, Darrell Najimoglu, uh, all making great points on, on either side. Generally, I think a reasonable stance uh, in, in this debate is that, that uh, rigorous impact evaluation of those kind should be done when the benefits exceed the costs. And I, I think some of, the, some, of the, 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 some of the evidence we've looked at from this concrete example suggests some, some times when benefits will, see, will exceed the cost. The cost is very important. In this case, it's 16% of the intervention cost for a, a pilot intervention. Whether or not you think that's low is a, is a matter of opinion. I find it very low. Um, uh, a policy decision is not needed instantly. Definitely, uh, bottled water for Haiti earthquake victims is not something that should be subject to an RCT. Uh, that's intuitive to people. But what is the point at which urgency uh, uh, supersedes? Um, to me, when you're talking about bringing self-sustaining economic growth to places that have never had it since human beings evolved, that's something which is a long-term enterprise, and it's worth 10 years to figure out what you're doing. Uh, that's a controversial opinion, and, and the, 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 the project has expressed a, a, uh, another opinion about the urgency of these measures. Um, what we're talking about here is creating economic growth. This is not a humanitarian charity intervention. Uh, to, to me, the, the, uh, the policy decision in this area is not needed instantly. Um, and the consequences of being wrong are particularly bad. If, if the opportunity cost of aid is zero, then there are no consequences to this. Why not just spend some money in salary and see what happens? Uh, to me, spending $580 million, spending half a billion dollars in Southwest China for nothing, uh, is particularly bad. But again, that's a matter of opinion. Um, when it's impossible to treat everyone right away. And certainly that's true of the many bills, but they don't have the money to treat everybody right away. So it, it, it can't be that there are no comparison sites. Comparison sites are mandated by the situation. Um, when, uh, when strong interest necess necessitated an objective criterion of success, we think it's important to have an objective criterion, and, and by far the best way to do this would be to have an independent agency conduct the evaluation. Uh, 3IE is a new international agency explicitly created for that purpose, and they, 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 they do a great job. Uh, in the case of Progresa, I think one of the strengths of the evaluation was its independence. The Mexican government did not carry it out. Uh, that's not the case in the Million Village Project. And uh, Gabriel stressed the external validity. We're talking about scaling something up across a continent. And there's uh, some reason to think that the treatment sites are something like the, uh, the uh, scaled up sites. And, and certainly that's possible in the, in the Million Village Project setting. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, strong constraint on being able to say something about the referral interventions of this kind across the common uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the initially evaluated sites. Thank you so much for all your thanks. attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Gabriel and Michael. Uh,